Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Uh, my name's Eddie. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, everybody. It's a real honor to be here tonight. Um, Sacramento. I'm from here. Well, I, I, I was raised and, uh, born and raised in Bakersfield, which is scary, but I've been here a long time, so this is my home. And, um, I, um, I don't know where to start. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure I want to start there. I've only got 15 minutes. Um, I think they picked the speakers tonight for their hair. What do you think? <laughs> I was really hoping Sylvia would wear hers down tonight. I was thinking it was kind of a spiritual thing, you know. Um, I haven't caught up with her yet, but I'm on my way. Um, when I was asked to do this, um, I had just turned five years sober. I'm nearing six now. And for those of you who've been around a while, you know what it's like at five years. And you get asked to do this kind of thing. You think you know. You think you know how this program works and that you're going to be up here and you're going to be dynamite and you're going to tell all these people how it works. And um, they don't tell you about the fifth year when you first get here, you know. <laughs> So you got to keep coming back, and you'll find out, because yours will be different than mine, but it'll happen. And uh, this is the year that my ass fell off. <laughs> and I've been told it'll keep falling off for possibly five more years, maybe longer. Um, so you really get to learn. I've really learned how to do this program a day at a time. Um in the last year of my sobriety. Um, the spring fling is um, really uh, wonderful. Um, it's been um, a really beautiful part of my sobriety. My first spring fling, um, I got to uh, chair the, the uh, Friday night kickoff meeting. And, um, and then I got to be on the committee for three years after that. And... Uh, um, I learned that you can be angry in Alcoholics Anonymous through um, committee work <laughs> and um, get to work through that shit, um, get to the other side of it, and uh, that's all I know. Um, I, uh, I was 23 years old when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. I did not plan to get here. Um, a friend of mine um, that I drank and used with got sober a year before I did, and she needed to. Um, she was a blackout drinker. I wasn't. At least I didn't think I was. And um, so as she uh, became sober, our relationship um, began to diminish. Um, she had less time for me. Um, she wasn't hanging out in the bar and drinking. So um, a year later, I ended up at her house, and uh, I was hitting my bottom, and I didn't realize it. I, uh, I, um, I was on my way to uh, a church that morning um, because my life was um, – just horrible. Just I. I was really. Um, um, I was really sad. I was. I was doing a lot of shit um, that I wasn't real proud of, and um, and I felt awful. And uh, I. Uh, I went to this friend's house and I asked her if she would go to church with me, and uh, she didn't want to go to church, and. Uh, so I went by myself, and I sat in the back row of this church, and I said, God, 
My life is fucked up. I don't know why. Please help me. Um, I went back to that friend's house, and um, she hung out with me that day, and I ended up in my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous that night. She did not suggest that I need to go. Um, she listened to my tragic story, and uh, and she made me re- feel real safe. And I didn't want to leave her presence. And as a result of that, I went to my first meeting. And um, there was someone attractive in that first meeting, uh, physically, and that kept me coming back to my second meeting. <laughs> and um, that's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you um, that um, this year, in the last, um, well, in the last two weeks, I got my message to Carrie uh, that, um, you know, you come around here and you hear a lot of speakers say they know what their message is to Carrie. Mine is, don't date the newcomer. <laughs> Didn't work for me. Um might work for some, but it didn't work for me. So do what you want. I really don't care. Um, just stay sober. Um, anyways, I uh, started going to meetings, and um, that friend of mine that um, took me to my first meeting um, – I don't know how she did it, but she got me to uh, secretary a meeting at 30 days sober. Now, the requirement was 90 days sober, and I don't know. They slid me in there somehow. And um, it was another one of those things that kept me coming back. I did not know that I was an alcoholic when I got here. I, um, I certainly had drank enough to, to be an alcoholic. I didn't know it yet. And... I heard in meetings to listen to the similarities and not the differences, and um, that if I did that, that um, that I would identify, and um, that has been my experience since I've been here. Um, I think my biggest gift, um, well, I don't know, I can't, I can't gauge them. Uh, a gift that I have since I've been here is honesty. At, at at group level, um, I think um, that the way the steps work, um, the uh, the key to to um, establishing a relationship with a higher power has been through um, opening up my mouth and telling you the truth when I really didn't want to, because when I open up my mouth and I tell you the truth, God hears it too, and um, I don't have to keep carrying around that shit that I drank over or would possibly drink over in the future. Um, Like I said, this was, this has been the, uh, um, the, the, the toughest year of my sobriety. And I think um, the reason you, the reason we suggest you go to meetings and you get involved in the fellowship early on is you need the support. I've needed the support. I want to do something here. Um, I like um, all of my friends, people that that um, have touched my life and I've touched their lives, to please raise their hands. I want to tell you that that's the gift. That's the gift that this program has given me, is the people here um, love me, and I love them, and um, I'm really glad to be here. Thanks.
Thank you, Eddie. Tonight, um, our main speaker is Sylvia D. Hello, everybody. I'm a very, very grateful alcoholic. My name is Sylvia. And I'm very, very grateful to be here tonight. I feel very humble, responsible, all kinds of mixed up things uh, about it. But uh, I would like to preface that I do not deliberately set out to be controversial, to be confrontive, etc., etc. Hopefully tonight, God showed up too, and uh, I will just be able to share my experience. Every one of us in this room has an experience, and it just happens to be my turn right now at this moment to share my experience and hopefully there will be some strength and hope there also my experience would be irrespective of anything that has to do with Alcoholics Anonymous just being sober the strength and hope will hopefully come from my sharing my experience of how it works with this dis-ease of alcoholism. Uh, I do need an outline. It's not all written out because that's a lot of time. (laughs) It's a long time that I've been around here, especially for somebody that wasn't going to stay very long. I remember when I came here and somebody that had 90 days, it seemed like, my God, that was like such a tremendous amount of time to be out in the streets and not drinking. That might have given a little hint that Alcoholics Anonymous did not find me in the streets in freedom Thank God for the Hospital and Institution Committee of Alcoholics Anonymous. Okay, we'll run through this real quickly here. (laughs) Are you ready? (laughs) Anyway, the Barrios was where I got started. My class is 62 of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I happen to have also been born the same year of Alcoholics Anonymous, so it was a great year. In the barrio, I was born and raised in them. They were Mexican and black. There were six of us. Five of us are in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I happen to have been uh, battered. Uh, We were very poor, but like someone said before, and I totally buy it when you're A kid, you don't really know you're poor. Just whatever's there, that's the way it is. It's after looking back on it without the steps that I could get resentful about it. (laughs) I uh, happen to have also been uh, raped at eight by a friend of the family. Sometimes I haven't made that clear, and some people have thought it was a member of the family. I had tremendous shame and guilt and got a lot of punishment for that which obviously had a lot of resentment and mistrust grow uh, between myself and the opposite sex. And it grew stronger and stronger as uh, time went on. When I was 12, I was in an accident. I was hit by a car and uh, went through the air. I used to say with the greatest of ease, but I doubt it. I doubt it. I was just a little... She can at that time, Mexican American, and I was five feet tall. Six months later, I was five foot seven. As a result of uh, other broken bones and stuff, there was a concussion in the 
pituitary gland got jostled around a little bit, and I just grew up. But honest to God, that was one of the greatest things, as I look back on it, that uh, happened. It got me to Alcoholics Anonymous real quick, you know, because I went in a little girl, and I came out for all intents and purposes a grown woman. And for somebody that absolutely had no idea what was happening out there, it seemed like, hey, party time. Anyway, uh, I was around 13 or so. I got drunk. Uh, the first time they say alcoholics, only alcoholics remember the first thing they drank. If anybody out there doesn't remember the first thing they drank, doesn't mean you're not an alcoholic. It happened to have been Rainier Ale for me, two quarts of it, and I chug-a-lugged it as fast as I could, and still have a tendency to still chug-a-lug liquids, only they're now Coca-Colas, classic Coke, if you please. Somehow, I ended up in uh, a car at the end of a trolley line with a streetcar driver fighting him off, because it Regardless of all that, down deep inside, there was a lot of fear about all that sex and all that stuff. I ended up in reform school, uh, and that's where I met the father of my oldest daughter. And it was in downtown Los Angeles. Obviously, if I went to reform school, I obviously couldn't fit, didn't fit in regular schools. But I was so, I'm going to jump a little bit, and maybe I shouldn't, but the thing of, I'm so grateful for Alcoholics Anonymous for such a tremendous thing of removing from me the illusion that I had to fit in there, out in the world. I hate the world. Do you hear me? I, I just am able to operate in it with and through the grace of God. But needing to belong in it and fit in it, thank God for Alcoholics Anonymous. Anyway, uh, there was a statutory rape uh, uh, between this man and I. I was pregnant. Uh, I wouldn't tell on him in court. He promised marriage. And uh, he went to prison anyway on a violation of parole. He happened to have been... 13 years my uh, senior. And at that age, that's a big, big, long jump there. He went to prison anyway, and uh, that was more enforcement of abandonment for me, unwanted. I couldn't go home. I had this child. I was able to go home eventually. And uh, when that child uh, was uh, 18 months, I married a normal guy, not a ex-convict, not a heroin user, not a robber, cheat, thief, um, which is what I was too, but he just had been at it a little longer than I had in that world. And so it was going to be different. I didn't really think that at the time, but, you know, we'll jump from an ex-convict to uh, what turned out to be later a Dallas, Texas policeman. But anyway, that's after he abandoned us when our child was six months old. Went to the cleaners, said he was going to the cleaners, he'd be right back. <laughs> to this day, never saw hide or hair of him. More, more mistrust. Okay. This is like I'm talking about somebody else, you know. More resentment, self-hate, fear, didn't belong anywhere except one place. Drunk in the bars. That was like, talk about mirrors and lights, you know. That was it. If I could have just, you know how good you look in those bars, you know, <laughs> sitting across, you know. <laughs> you could just take the mirror home, you know, for the next morning. I was a bar drinker, that make-believe world, the, all of it, the lights, the music, everything. More alcohol. 
coming home one night out of one of those bars bouncing from wall to wall, uh, another incident of being gang raped in uh, Wilmington, San Pedro and dumped in a cemetery. Lot. Resentment, self-loathing, couldn't even call the police. It's like I had it coming somehow from way back there. It's my fault somehow. Thank God for the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's nobody's fault anymore. It just was what it was. More alcohol to drown resentment, fear, shame, self-hate, sadness, loneliness, despair. Drinking, drinking, drinking. County General Hospital in Los Angeles. Just come to one day. Come to one day. Paralyzed. Can't move. Have to try to scratch a note so my daughter can take it to a neighbor. I couldn't, I don't know what happened. I like to look back on it and think that the way I was drinking, it was just my body's way of saying enough. Yes, too, enough, you know, in that moment. This was, you know, before teenage alcoholism was really uh, so much in the media. And uh, I ended up in the county general hospital, IVs, uh, and the doctor saying, you know, you you drink too much, you know. Uh, that gave me, that incident gave me a fear of alcohol because I was totally, that was not fun. That was not fun in games to uh, uh, awaken to that. But it wasn't enough to keep me stopped for more than probably a week, I think, as I can recall. And I just thought, well, I'll just smoke more pot. But what happens is, like anything, took away the will to care and, hey, you know, what's a little champagne, you know, to just have with this little stick of weed here? And I was off and running again. But the fear was gone. The fear of alcohol very soon after that, though, uh, got me in a position to uh, uh, try heroin. I am alcoholic number one first. It was just recently, oh, within the last couple of years, I, with all the research and stuff that comes out, it says there's only two drugs that seem to go to the same place in the brain that does the same thing, and that's alcohol and heroin. Alcohol does for the alcoholic what heroin does for the heroin addict. Those are my only two uh, oh. things that I had uh, uh, experience uh, with an Alcoholics Anonymous uh, takes care of them very, very well. I had no control over either. I was hooked on both. And then comes the prostitution, the crime, the extreme addiction, and a Bonnie and Clyde existence because this man now that went to jail some years back, this is six, seven years almost later after that, he happened to see my picture in a downbeat uh, magazine. I was a tremendous... Uh, I love jazz, uh, and I worked in a stroller's bar in Long Beach, which was a real jazz mecca kind of club, and uh, I was a waitress there, and he happened to have seen in one of the magazines, there was a picture of the club of the guys playing, but there was this waitress over there which serving drinks, which happened to be me, and it just happened in that jail where he was that... The sister that I used to work in that bar with, her brother was there with this man in the same jail. He says, oh, you know her? My sister knows her. Bloop, bloop. And so we were able to then hook up again after all these years and continue our drop into hell when he came out. <laughs> and that was where the Bonnie and Clyde... Uh, Existence uh, came about and uh, ran rampant through Los Angeles. I had guilt about children who I had been to my mother, sending stolen money to hide the guilt. And all of this ended up on Eastern Avenue in East Los Angeles in a motel after a armed robbery that we had done at this point. And one of the beginning of the few 
real awakenings that uh, came to me. That The minute we got into the room, it's like all the lights lit up of all the sheriffs that had completely, totally surrounded this huge motel. And it was like I had breathed a sigh because finally we're going to get killed. It's finally going to be over with because it was like I was like an animal. I was totally, and I know what it's like to live in hell, when there is not enough booze at all. No matter how much there would be, it ain't enough. Not enough heroin, not enough money, not enough nothing. That is hell. Total no satisfaction, as Mick says. And what happened was, one of those little mini uh, miracles. We're down on our knees, not for any kind of religious reasons, and <laughs> just because it seemed good to have the bed between the door and the man has got the gun. And the minute the police come in, they're going door to door. We can just hear them going door to door. The minute they open the door, he'll open fire, and then they'll open fire, and we'll be gone. And it was like I was really just relieved. And they kept going, they kept going, they kept going, and all of a sudden they were gone. There were so many of them, this guy thought he'd gone there. This guy thought he'd gone there. And ours was the only room that didn't get gone into. Talk about anti-climax. <laughs> but what it was all waiting for was a little bit down the road to get arrested coming back from Tijuana where he went on to get six ten to lives running wild. He already had federal and state parole from a bank robbery kidnap before. I did three years in the Los Angeles County Jail on the 13th floor. Did not see sunlight at all for all that time. And that's where A&A came and... I knew absolutely nothing about it, didn't mean anything to me except a way to get out from the slammer and go there and, you know, talk to these ladies about all my problems, all the stuff that's happening, you know, how unjust all of that is. I talked about everything, but not the real problem, right? I didn't even know I had a problem. I thought my problem was that I was locked up in jail. See? I was released, uh, finally, in custody to go on to Orange County to face... I had faced three armed robberies there in Orange County. The only reason I ever was in Orange County because that's between the border and L.A. in there on that road. I got out. I won't bore you with all those details. It was... It was miraculous, but what happened was I had gotten to the point where there was nothing the state of California could do to me, no matter what they'd done, to have me pain more for the self-reproach and the horrendous way I felt about myself. I mean, nobody could do it any worse than I was already doing it to myself. Because the majority of this was without being under the influence of anything, although I must say that I had my last fix in the county jail. Nearly died in withdrawal because I never stopped drinking. See, that was, drinking was my glue. The other stuff was just part of it. But to withdraw from that, uh, it was a bear. It was a bear, and it nearly killed me, but not enough to frighten me to find the ways and means in jail to get some more. Anyway, even forgetting, you know, what I'd done before, that alcohol was what had whipped my behind to even let me get to think that heroin would look like some kind of uh, relief kind of a thing, because everybody kind of, you know, would sit around and kind of scratch and kind of, you know, have slobber come out of his mouth and just talk about, what's happening, man, you know, where 
at that point, boy, when I drink or, you know, let's go, let's go dance, let's go listen to music, let's, well, man, you know, like, what's that? <laughs> Didn't seem very inviting to me. Until you get very frightened by uh, alcohol, and it's, that's it, that's where it is, all around there. Anyway, uh, the grace of God uh, entered even before I really knew it, even right there in the Los Angeles County Jail. I came out, and uh, I wasn't out very long, and I knew my answer was, just sell the stuff. Hey, I got no problem with that, you know. Obviously, I did. I, I, the minute it was put in my hands, it went. Uh, I dropped it, ran like a crazy woman, uh, just couldn't understand my behavior. Went to see... Uh, I had seen my father who offered me a drink. See, all this time I'm, I've got this tremendous obsession not to take anything because I didn't do the time. It did me. It kicked my behind for three years. So I just balled it all up and together, you know, that I'm not, I have an obsession not to take anything. I could not handle it, though. I went to see my father. He offered me a drink. I had a can of Olympia beer, straight shot of whiskey, and I thought, Man, how stupid. What have I been waiting for? This is it. I'm so busy not wanting to take heroin, I forgot what I really was, which was an alcoholic. And it's legal. So I commenced to drink it illegally. That's how. That's how. And what happened was, very quickly, I got everything in spades that I had missed with my youth before. And little flashbacks of the little ladies talking about meetings and this and that, what have you. But they told me, you better go to Narcotics Anonymous. We, we, you know, didn't ever talk anything. Because I thought to have a problem with alcohol means you'd had to get arrested for it. And I'd never been arrested for anything con alcohol connected. <laughs> anyway, I call central office. The grace of God again came when I was told that men with men and women with women and a moment of truth, life, and love happened uh, in that. I was living in projects. I had both my children back at this point. I had been paroled to psychiatry, a doctor of psychiatry. I was on AFDC, and I went to meetings, 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 meetings. Took my fear, anger, sadness, loneliness, isolation, because I didn't feel that I fit in. I didn't feel I belonged. And I didn't, because all I was doing was going to the meetings and just hanging on, thinking, somehow I'm going to hear something. They said, you keep coming and you'll hear your story. Well, I, t I was so ignorant, I took everything literally. Until my head was just hurting from listening so hard. But what happened is, I wasn't able to go more than six months. This was all told to me just recently, within the last two years. Because I had the suicidal thoughts of wanting to kill myself, because I just don't belong. I mean, I'm not drinking. I'm going to 10 and 12 meetings a week, and it ain't getting better. And you know what? It ain't going to get better, because it is me up here. And unless I take this through the steps, what is there to get better? So I had no hope. Had wanted to kill myself overtly. I mean, sure, some of the things I'd done had me put myself in that position. But I came to... In this weird blackout of whatever happened, stone cold sober. And I was in the parking lot of the Los Angeles County Jail in my permanent conver Plymouth convertible. That The top wouldn't go back up. It was permanently a convertible. <laughs> and I came to. And I had no idea how I'd gotten from point A to point B. And all I knew is that I've got to get to a meeting. Now, I've just told you I've been to 10, 12 meetings a week. I went to this meeting, and for the first time, I heard Chapter 5 that how it works 
is how it works. It's pretty simple, huh? I asked someone what they were talking about with this written inventory. I figured I'd work the first three steps, and it wasn't working because I had no understanding of God. It's like my program had three steps, and at the third step, you have a total, complete understanding of God, and everything's just going to be wonderful, you know. Because the first time I heard anything about a sponsor, I said, I don't want one, don't need one. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. So I was left to my own devices, see? Just getting this information, running it through this broken tool, and coming out thinking, you know, the only thing that saved me was this tremendous, tremendous obsession not to take anything. To show how powerful even that first, fourth step was, that is, as someone earlier in the meeting said, it's the one where you blame everybody. No matter, the power of the written word was so powerful that since that first one that I took, it has never entered my pea brain to want to kill myself. That is extremely powerful stuff, you see. Asking God to remove my resentments and fears. At that time, it was, I must say, a running narrative of who did this and why they did it and what I'll do and this and that, whatever. But eventually, it did get to what the big book said, which was to write down my resentments and fears. I continue to do that. I must have conscious contact with God. And for me, that conscious contact is in my head. And it comes by taking out of my head these resentments and fears. Facing and being rid of them on the paper in front of me. At 20 years sober, I met a man and fell in love instantly in an Italian restaurant when I had given up hope of any kind of any of this. This other man came out uh, of prison, the father of my uh, oldest daughter. We didn't even last uh, a year. I was 10 years sober when he came out. And uh, it was horrendous. Uh, and finally, he, he had to go because I, I, I tried to kill him, really. <laughs> this was 10 years sober. See, that's what happens with resentment about not getting your will, you see. Somehow I thought, oh, we're staying 10 years and running and visiting in prison. Somehow I had something coming for it, you know doesn't work like that. It says, pray only for knowledge of God's will. And I have no idea what God's will is. I'm glad God does. Because I don't know, see. I only want knowledge of it. And how I get to know the knowledge of it is that it's harmony. And it's good. And it's joy and it's peace. Anything else? Guess whose will it is? That's it. That's it. You got it. You got it. So I continued. When I met this man... We, I had been 3,300 miles away in Boston, Massachusetts, and something kept telling me, you can come back now. I had two weeks vacation there. I loved it on the East Coast. The subways, the snow, I'd never seen it before, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, that's what I came back for. I had met him peripherally in a meeting three years before he was going through a divorce nothing happened no lights went on anything but this was it three years later it was a tremendous thing it was there's a meeting in los angeles in santa monica called the five and dime the first speaker has to have five years and five years or more and the second speaker 10 years or more and he was 11 years sober that night and we fell in love and i was courted for the first time in my life, long distance, doesn't matter. And then we were married on Valentine's Day. That was, so there are, I, I have to say that at first, you know, I, I never used to put that kind of in because I had this sensitivity of uh, uh, people out there, you know, without anybody or whatever. And I thought, no, I've gotten to a point now where to give hope that, that that's a good thing 
to want. There's nothing wrong with that. But the point is, like somebody uh, mentioned about, or or it's been said, and I used to say it in the beginning, you know, no relationships in the first year and all that. How dare me, you know. Anybody can get in any kind of relationship they want as long as they do the steps. What's the big deal? If you're doing the steps and getting rid of your fears and resentments, I have no business telling anybody what to do, when to do it, how to do it. I mean, there's some days I do, there's some days I don't do the things I want to do and do the things I don't want to do. So what makes me able to tell somebody else what to do? And you see, that's what happens in this equality that happens with the steps. That God is the ultimate real sponsor. No human power. There's no human power that can keep anybody sober, make them kill themselves. None of it. You see? And this is the ultimate therapy. The 12 steps. That's why it doesn't work too well when you do another one. You can't do two at the same time. Pick one or the other. So that when they don't work, you're not confused about which one didn't work. Or when it works, how do you know which one worked for you? <laughs> anyway, that comes through long, hard, troubled stuff of my making exceptions. And people killing themselves when they got to the confusing part and figured they had worked it and it didn't work. Pow! You see, I only need one of that to stand principally that this Alcoholics Anonymous 12 Steps, to me, this is my experience, is the ultimate therapy that with it, to abandon oneself to God, as it says in our big book, is what does it. And if you don't have to do it, you don't have to do it. That's all. It's no big deal. I have to do it. And I have to share about it. And it's, to, it's such a wonderful thing, like I said, that we all have our experience to share. You see, lack of power was my dilemma, as the big book says. I am no longer powerless over alcohol as long as I don't drink it. You see, the first step is we were powerless. Were. You see. So that means I'm being empowered by something, this new manager, to get it together, to give up this unmanageability. I need a power greater than myself to relieve my alcoholism. You see, just putting the plug in the jug, that's a great beginning. A great beginning. But I don't want to be walking around here like I was for a long while with untreated alcoholism. With the fears up here. That one power, as the big book says, that one power is God. Now, immediately, each one of you has an idea of God. And the newer you are, the more in tune you are that it didn't work. God is just, you know. So that's why I like to make very specifically the loving God of Alcoholics Anonymous that comes as the result of working these steps. See, then we're all talking about the same Loving God. Not my old idea, not your old idea, not your sponsor's old idea, none of it. Your own experience that you have gotten as a result of working these steps. And I'm so grateful for that, you see. So grateful for that. Because I need that power. I need God's power to give up my resentment and fear so that I can thereby experience good God. Because resentment, which is the number one offender in Saudi Arabia, in a group meeting, I don't care where it is, resentment is the number one offender. It's the cause of my powerlessness. See? 
And if it's left in my mind unmanageable, and that unmanageability requires coming to believe that a power greater than myself can restore me to sanity. What's sanity? Less obsessions of the mind. Less, mind you, I said less obsessions of the mind. More peace, more manageability. How? I make a decision to do what works. What works? Four through nine. With pen in hand, I observe the state of my brain, and I reveal on the empty page the resentments that cause the pain. And I observe further, and then I reveal the fear underneath that resentment. The self-centered fears which are the cause of all forms of spiritual disease. And the big book says, when I do that, I will straighten out mentally and physically. And the big book, again, in dealing with resentment, we continue to set them on paper. Nothing counted but thoroughness and honesty. I didn't make the program up. It's not mine. It was here when I got here. Thank God. Fear is an evil and corroding thread. The fabric of our existence is shot through with it. Fear sets in motion trains of consciousness which bring misfortune, regret, remorse, despair. I'm talking about sober. <laughs> you know, it doesn't all stop just because I quit drinking. Now it's here, full face, right here smack dab in front of me. So I put my fears on paper, even though I may not have a resentment connected with them, the big book tells me. Then I admit in honest communication the exact nature of my spiritual dis-ease, which is resentment and fear, to God, to myself, and another human being. For if I'm progressively to be free of this disease, I must be entirely ready to have my resentments and fears removed. Not analyze them, not figure them out. Not figure out what side of the street is mine. None of that. Because once I give it all up and ask God to remove it, there ain't nothing to analyze. There's nothing to figure out. It's gone. I can be happy and joyous and free till the next thing that comes up that I don't like. I mean, this is progress. We're not talking perfection here. I am so grateful for Alcoholics Anonymous and everything that it's given me. All of it, all of it, all of it, all of it, all of it. I'm going to... And I'm going to finish it up here with just saying that a lot of times I've heard... What does it say in the 10th step that it has to be written, etc., etc.? I want to be able to say, if I don't do that, to just be honestly... I don't write it, but not to argue about it. Continue means to keep doing what you did before. And the only way I would not write in a tenth step is if I'd never written in the fourth. Then I'd continue to do that. For me, it must be daily, but not to get even clear. See, just like everyone has an idea about God, everyone has an idea about what an inventory is. I mean, I've heard some hairy stories about people locking themselves up and for hundreds of pages of all this stuff, you know, just coming out. Good God. And when they hear me say, they think, they think I'm going to do that every day. Listen, after you do that once, I don't ever want to hear about an inventory again like that. So, again, it's like communication. What are we talking about? What is a sponsor? What is an inventory? It's just these little buzzwords that everybody has their own interpretation about it. But it's simple. The big book tells us it's just resentment and fears. And for me, I must do it on a daily basis. Otherwise, I'm going to have to be flat out dependent that nothing is going to change. Got a good job. Got a husband. Got money. Hey, what do you mean resentments? I ain't got no resentments. Everything is great. What are you talking about writing or written inventory every day? Yeah, get out of here. But. It's all invested that nothing better change. I better not lose that job. My husband better not leave me. I better not lose that car. Because what will happen? I will have been non-committed to giving up those little teeny resentments. And I don't want to play Russian roulette. How many of those can I keep letting pile up, pile up, pile up, pile up until something's got to crack, something's got to break. 
For this way there is joy and freedom for those of us that have to do it. I'm not saying everybody does. I, I told you, I didn't make this up. <laughs> it ain't mine. You see, I am so grateful, so grateful, so grateful for all of this because I know I know in these 29 years that there is no way of helping an alcoholic to achieve sobriety without doing these steps. No. God is the love in AA. Love is the one that delivers the message, not me. And if I have as my primary purpose the existence to stay sober, and help others to achieve sobriety, I won't get drunk no matter what. But I tell you what, I will do a hell of a lot of written inventory about it all. That's right. That's right. And be free of it, and be able to be joyous and free, so that I'm not stuck with pain. See, a lot of people think that, well, it's painful to face that stuff every day. What are you talking about? But what happens is if I don't face it, I get to thinking the pain is the situation. When it's the fear, and once the fear is removed, hey, I get to go through that door, go through that thing, whatever it is, to get on the other side. And what I get to do is cumulatively build up trust in the loving God of Alcoholics Anonymous. So that when the big book says, trust God and clean house, I don't have to go into my head. It works because I'm doing it. It works, and it's easy to carry. It's easy to pass it on. No matter if nobody, that's why you wait for somebody to ask you. You don't just go running around, hey, come on, dude, you got to do inventory. You look like you're in pain. Do some inventory. No, no. For the alcoholic to be able to ask for and then accept spiritual help, that's why... Meanwhile, you just have fun. Go to meetings, share your experience, laugh, talk, carry on, have fun. If somebody wants what you have, they'll ask you. If they don't, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I am so grateful for this way of life. Alcoholics Anonymous. For the alcoholic woman, sister, person that this is that can keep on with this. Nothing is stale. It's still inspirational to me 29 years later, and I hope I get to be a real old, old, old lady just still coming to meetings. Thank you very, very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.